Yes, and I want you to uh, kindly uh, introduce our speaker for the evening before you leave. I'm told you have other engagements after yeah. this. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. Uh, yes, and uh, but I've uh, requested my pastor, a very able man of God from South Africa. Actually, he was to come on Sabbath because Pastor Gerald had indicated that he may not be coming, and I had approached him to come and preach. So it seems like Providence has still prepared him to speak to Karingato people. Well, Pastor Kim is uh, Pastor Kim Rowe is a stewardship director in one of the uh, unions in South in South Africa. I think he will make it much more clearer. He's a student in the Masters of Biblical Studies, basically biblical languages, that is Greek and Hebrew. And um, yeah, he's a very dedicated man of God. That's why he's usually ready to stand in. And therefore, I want to pray that the Lord will bless you, Pastor Kim, Amen. as you share the word of God with his children. Let me pray for you, Pastor, before you start. Mm -hmm. uh, Holy Father, God of Israel, you have been truly, truly gracious to us since the break of the day. Our lives are all about you, to praise you, to give you glory. Uh, we want to thank you that you've gathered us all today to come and wait upon you. Fulfill your word that you never cast away any who comes to thee in sincerity and fullness of heart, fullness of, of, of faith. Bless your son as he speaks to your people. Bless him with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Pastor Kim, you are welcome. And Thank you Lord. so much. Mm -hmm. This is a very loving church. This is a very loving church, Karengata. I guess you've just become a family member since from today. Thank you. Yes, I look forward to meeting everyone in person. I still can't believe that I'm not in Kenya anymore. I was there for a whole month. And now I'm back in South Africa. So I'm just adjusting to my home again. I've just arrived. Uh, so uh, thank you for the privilege um, to share God's word. And I believe that the scripture that we are meditating this evening is Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, the last portion. So uh, I would like us to, to start with um, verse 7's beginning. It says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him, and worship him. I just want to check, am I audible? Can everyone hear me? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Coming to you. Okay. Thank you, thank you. And worship him. And then it continues to say, who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Now, when uh, Dr. David asked me to share a message, um, the devotion that I had there in the um, airport this morning in Nairobi while I was sitting waiting for the flight was very early in the morning. I was uh, busy reading God's word and I was reading from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. And the Lord just uh, placed a, a message in my heart to share with you tonight. So I trust it will be a blessing to you and, and that you will be inspired by God's word. Now, what is interesting is, in the three angels' message, the word for worship occurs twice. So in verse 7, it says, worship him. And then verse 9, it says, if anyone worships the, the beast, right? So we can see that there's a choice that we have to make. Either we worship him or we're going to worship the beast. And all throughout scripture right from the beginning um, there's actually a choice about worship i'm sure you can remember the story of cain and abel it also revolved around worship and i think the question that we must ask ourselves tonight is how do we worship him 
Number one is, is who do we worship and then how do we worship? And if we go to um, the gospel according to John, now I'm sure we all know that John, the disciple who became John the apostle, he wrote the book of John. He also wrote the three epistles of John and he wrote the book of Revelation. And if we go to John chapter 4, John chapter 4, it's a well-known story, the, the woman at the well, Jesus is talking to her, verse 22, um, maybe we should start with verse 21, Jesus said to a woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father, you worship what you do not know, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must, know. Revelation says, worship him. And when we worship him, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, the, the message that I want to bring to us tonight comes from um, the book Patriarchs and Prophets, and it is a chapter called Balaam. Balaam is chapter 40. It's an easy one to remember, chapter 40. Now, I'm sure we all remember the story of Balaam. Um, he actually used to be a prophet of God, but he apostatized. And um, when the children of Israel were camping on the borders of Canaan, the king of Moab, Balak, was getting worried. So he heard that there was this prophet who had powers. And uh, I'm not going to go into the whole story how he was called, but eventually he came on the donkey. And God said to him, okay, you will only say what I will put in your mouth. Now, what's very interesting is that Balaam um, spoke three times. And they were actually from three different places. Now, the first one, the mountain is not named. But what I found very interesting in Patriarchs and Prophets is that seven altars were built there. He to curse, but he blessed. Then he went up to Pisgah, and there seven altars were built, and he tried to curse, but he blessed. And then he went to the third mountain, which was Pio, and there he tried to curse, but he blessed. Now, <clears throat> the king of Moab was very angry. And Balaam then went back to his country. But then he thought of a scheme. Now, this is the part that I want us to take note of this evening. While Israel was worshipping God faithfully in spirit and in truth and being obedient to him, walking in his ways. Satan could do nothing to them. He couldn't touch them. Anything and everything that was tried against them did not succeed. But then Balaam made a plan. So I'm going to read here from page 451. Disappointed in his hopes of wealth and promotion in disfavor with the king and conscious that he had incurred the displeasure of God, Balaam returned from his self-chosen mission. After he had reached his home, the controlling power of the Spirit of God left him. 
and his covetousness, which had been merely held in check, prevailed. He was ready to resort to any means to gain the reward promised by Balak. Balaam knew that the prosperity of Israel, listen carefully, the prosperity of Israel depended upon their obedience to God, and that there was no way to cause their overthrow but by seducing them into sin. He now decided to secure Balak's favor by advising the Moabites of the course to be pursued to bring a curse upon Israel. He immediately returned to the land of Moab and laid his plans before the king. The Moabites themselves were convinced that so long as Israel remained true to God, he would be their shield. I want us to to mark that one, if you can underline it or highlight it, it says, so long as Israel remained true to God, he would be their shield. Tonight, I want to say to you, dear friends, as long as we worship him, we are safe. We'll be protected. But when we don't worship him, the opposite will be true. The plan proposed by Balaam was to separate them from God by enticing them into idolatry. If they could be led to engage in the licentious worship of Baal and Ashtoreth, their omnipotent protector, capital P, would become their enemy. And they would soon fall a prey to the fierce warlike nations around them. This plan was readily accepted by the king, and Balaam himself remained to assist in carrying it into effect. Balaam witnessed the success of his diabolical scheme. Now, we're not going to go into all of that tonight, but basically what the plan was as follows. The Moabites sent in a woman. Uh, I believe they were naked prostitutes into the camp of Israel and God's people fell into sexual sin and then they worshipped Baal at Peor and there was a terrible plague that broke out in the camp. So they actually started with when you worship an idol, you are worshipping a demon. Balaam witnessed the success of his diabolical scheme. He saw the curse of God visited upon his people and thousands falling under his judgments. But the divine justice that punished sin in Israel did not permit the tempters to escape. In the war of Israel against the Midianites, Balaam was slain. He had felt that, friends, what I want to um, leave with you tonight is for us to be under the protection of God. And when you look at the context of Revelation chapter 14, I want us to go there. If you have your Bible, please page with me to Revelation chapter 14. So the first angel says that the hour of his judgment has come. The second one, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The third one, talks about the beast, worshipping the beast, his image, and his mark. And the only way for us to escape that is to worship him, worshipping as our creator, worship him as our savior, worship him as our king. Then we are safe and Satan cannot touch God's people. We will escape those judgments the seven last plagues when they come because we worship him. My dear friends, my prayer tonight is that we will open our hearts before God, that we will allow him to speak to us and that we'll be willing to humble ourselves and say, Lord, where we have sinned, please forgive us. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, that we'll worship God reverently.
And we know that the three angels' messages um, are tied together very much around the Sabbath commandment. And may the Sabbath be a wonderful day of worship and rejoicing in the presence of our God. And my prayer for you tonight is that you will worship him and that you will be always under the protection and the blessing of God. Amen. Amen. Amen.